Hello and welcome to video 4 for the review module for Algebra Part 1. In this video we're going to talk about applied mathematics, about the way in which mathematics connects to the real world. In most of these review modules I'm going to be pretty operational. I'm going to be talking about the actual mechanics of moving mathematical symbols around. But it's, it's important to remember that mathematics carries meaning and it relates to the world and all of these symbols eventually relate back to things we actually want to know about or measure or count or calculate. So this is about the variables we're using and how they encode real world problems. And I'm going to try and give you problems that are actually reasonable. One of the concerns I have with mathematics is a lot of the word problems that have been given in historical mathematics education, maybe in your background, maybe not, have been pretty contrived and I gave, promised myself at one point in time to never give a student a calculation that no one in the world would ever actually have to do. If we're going to talk about real world calculations, let's talk about things that people actually have to calculate. So let me give you some examples of translating into algebra some problems that, as far as I'm concerned, are things that people actually have to calculate. Now these may not be the actual real world numbers, but we do our best. This was recorded in the summer of 2020 in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, so that seemed like the most tangible and practical thing that people are actually calculating about all the time. So let's talk about a model of virus cases. In a particular community, there are currently 143 active cases, and the number of active cases is currently doubling every 23 days. It turns out in this community that 10% of those cases require hospitalization, and there are 47 hospital beds available. So a very important question, if nothing changes, if the doubling period stays the same, if the spread increases at this rate, when will the community actually reach capacity in its hospital? That's the thing you want to know. That tells you how much time you have to build something else or set up some other kind of resources so that you can actually handle the hospitalization of those who need it for the virus. Let's change these things, these statements, into mathematics. Let's start with the number of cases. I'm going to call that P. We have 143 cases. That's where we start. That's a constant. Good. It doubles every 23 days. So now instead of P being a constant, I'm going to think of P as a function of time. So I have a variable T. T is the number of days since this particular date when I had 143. And doubling every 23 days, and I'm not going to get into the details of how this works. You can look at the exponential chapter for that but it's an exponential function, 2 to the t over 23. So it basically means every time the number of days increases by 23, this is going to end up multiplying 143 by 2. So after 23 days, multiply by 2, we'll get 286, then multiply by 2 again, you've got 2 times whatever that is, every period of 23 days. However, we only care about 10% of those. 10% is 1 tenth, so we get 1 tenth times 143, should be a bracket there times 2 to the t over 23. So I only need to calculate one tenth of this total. So I have a new function that tells me the number of things that are hospitalized. And there are 47 hospital beds available. So the thing I need to solve is when this thing, this p of t, is actually going to be larger than 47. So the problem that I expressed here is encoded in this inequality. And my question is, what t, how many days until I actually get past this 47 number for hospital capacity. And I'm not going to solve that here. All I want to demonstrate here is the way in which a reasonable, well, I suppose unreasonable and terrible, but a, a real world problem has a reasonable translation into a mathematical statement that we actually can get an answer about it, telling you exactly how many days you have until your hospital runs out of capacity. Let me do a couple more, perhaps not quite as on point with current affairs when this was recorded, but to give you another demonstration. So this is about how much uh, fuel you can save for reducing the number of Canadians who commute by car. I've made up these statistics. I don't know if these statistics are correct, um, but for the purposes of demonstrating this, let's say that 75% of Canadians commute by car and that this number p is the population of employed Canadians. So whatever the, the number is, however many millions of us are employed. Uh, let's say the average commute is seven kilometers one way, um, and f is the average fuel usage per kilometer. Um, so 
however many liters per kilometer. So the question is here, how much fuel will be saved if we convinced 5% of people to not commute by car? And I want to try and express that in mathematical symbols based on what we've written down so far. So this is again a thing that governments care about if they make certain changes, if they have certain things that can affect behavior, tax incentives, transit, um, or bicycle or walking incentives, whatever the case is, something that changes people's behavior. They want to know how much, what's the impact, how much fuel is actually going to be saved. So I'm starting with my number P. Only 75% of them commute by car, so I need 75%. That's 75 over 100, the same as three quarters. So the population I'm starting with of commuters is 3P over 4, and the units there are people. The average commute is 7 kilometers one way. People commute there and back, so that's 14 kilometers. So I'll take this and multiply it by 14. For the average number of kilometers, this is kilometers per day. If you wanted kilometers per year, you could multiply by the number of working days per year. But I'll think about this as kilometers per day. So each day, 21 over 2 times the number P of commuting Canadians gives you the number of kilometers driven. And if F is the fuel usage per kilometer, if I take this and multiply it by F, I get this many liters. L is 4 liters. So I get 21 over 2 times P, the population, times F, the fuel usage, gives me liters per um, per day that these commuters are using. Now the question is, what if we manage to convince 5% of them to change? So I want to know what 5% of this is. So I multiply this by 120. 5% um, is the same as 5 over 100, the same as 1 over 20. So I get that 20 times 2 is 40, so 21 over 40. This is the number of liters saved each day by this particular thing. So 21 over 40 times the population of commuting people times the fuel usage per kilometer on average gives us the liters per day that is saved by this particular change in the behavior of Canadians. Hopefully again you can see how we're taking a bunch of statements and turning them into mathematical symbols and based on what the numbers are, based on what P is, based on what F is, we can actually calculate reasonably the thing we're trying to do, how much fuel is saved by a particular change in behavior. Uh, one last example. This is an example for uh, an airline. Let's say that an airline is trying to think about operating a route. Now this, this is a horrendously oversimplified thing, so I said that I didn't want my examples to be contrived. So this one's going to be a bit contrived by simplification, but more complicated versions of this are calculated every day by people who are running financial models for companies who are trying to decide what to do. Companies need to decide what to do based on what's going to be profitable, and that's often based on some kind of financial model involving mathematics. So let's say an airline is considering a particular route, um, and I'm going to assume this is 100 trips. So they're considering a contract for 100 flights on a certain route. Um, there's a fixed cost, so that's not per trip, but for the whole thing, maybe to purchase the original airplane or something. So there's some fixed cost to set up in terms of the infrastructure, uh, the rest of the company that you need to run this thing. And there's some cost per trip, so that each of these 100 trips, uh, there is a cost T for the fuel, for the maintenance, for the staff who are actually on the airplane to run that particular trip. Uh, there's some price of the average ticket price, and there's some average number of passengers per trip. And then the question is, uh, how many passengers do you need and or uh, what price do you need th those passengers to pay in order to make your route profitable over the 100 trips? And we can express this in an equation or an inequality. So the cost is the fixed cost plus the cost per trip times 100. So this here is the cost and the revenue is the number of passengers times the no ticket price, sorry, other way around, number of passengers n, p is the ticket price, times the number of trips. And if you want to break even, you make this an equality. That would be particularly getting your costs and your revenue exactly. Typically, as a company, you want your revenue to exceed your costs. Um, so I suppose this actually should be the other way around. So I want my costs to be less than my revenue. 
So I'm solving an inequality of what do I need P to be, what do I need N to be, in order that my revenue from selling tickets exceeds the cost of running the operation. And hopefully again you can see how a bunch of assumptions go into this and I take some things that I know, what are my costs, what are my ticket prices, what are my number of passengers, and I turn it into an equation or inequality that I can then solve for certain situations and make a decision of whether or not this is a profitable or not profitable thing for this particular airline company.